So last week, um, what we saw from John chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 18, was that Jesus died so that those who are dead might be born again. We saw that last week. This week, we're going to look at this reality. Jesus rose from the dead so that those who are born in him would never die. So that's, those are the two realities you have. Jesus died so that those who are dead might be born again, and he rose from the dead so that those who are born in him would never die. That's the thesis of today's sermon. But before we go any further, it seems good to me and to the Holy Spirit that I plead earnestly with you for a moment. And this plea is not on your sermon sheets because I want you, I want you to listen to it. The fact that Jesus was betrayed with a kiss was shocking even to Jesus. Listen carefully to the question that Jesus poses to Judas in Luke 22, verse 48. Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a, with a kiss? Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? A, a kiss? Judas, that's not what a kiss is for. A kiss is meant to show love and fealty, not betrayal. And you would take a symbol of something that's supposed to communicate loyalty and turn it into a symbol of betrayal? You would betray me with a kiss? This is not what a kiss is for. You would be more honest if you just bloodied my nose. That'd be honest. That would be honest. And my plea with you this morning is that you would not use God's word like Judas used a kiss. God's word is not meant to make you wise for a debate. It's meant to make you wise for salvation, 2 Timothy 3.15. God's word is not meant to equip you with knowledge that puffs up. It's meant to equip you with love that builds up, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1. It's not meant to kill your spirit and to feed your pride. It's meant to kill your pride and to feed your spirit, John chapter 6 and verse 63. Don't be a Judas with the word of God. Use use the Word of God for what it's for, to give life and receive the Word of God for what it's for, and that's to have life. There is, however, one prerequisite to receiving the Word of God, and it's humility. Listen to what James says in James 1.9. Receive with meekness the implanted Word. Receive With meekness. What? The implanted word. How am I supposed to receive it? With meekness. Receive the implanted word with meekness. How do I receive it? With meekness. With meekness. With meekness. How do you want me to receive your word? With meekness. Receive the implanted word with meekness, which is able to save your soul. There is a proper posture that one must have before he or she receives anything, especially the life that comes from God's word. You cannot approach the word of God with a spirit of pride and expect to receive anything from God because God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble, 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. Proud people don't receive grace from God in part because they don't think they need it. Those who are well have no need of a physician, only those who are sick, Matthew 9 and verse 12. And this is a problem for some of us. This is a problem for some of you. Ask yourself, how am I approaching God's word this morning when it's preached? How do I approach it? I mean, am I approaching it as a college professor or a teacher approaches a student's paper or math problem to sit in judgment over? I'm going to be the arbiter of what's true here. How do you receive it? How are you receiving it right now? Is that the way you receive it? Or do you approach the word of God like a meek little child with a mind that's willing to be shaped and to be formed and to be taught by God's word? Jesus himself says, whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child shall not enter it. Matthew 10 and 15. Likewise, you cannot receive his words like an instructor and expect God to give you instruction. You can't. If you want to receive anything from God, you've got to come to him like a kid. Like, Daddy, I don't know. I think I know how the world works. We all think we know how the world works, and we don't. That's our problem. 
We think we got it all figured out. And we do the same with God's Word. And we go to God's Word, and instead of saying, Oh God, won't you show me what you're like? Won't you show me what the new birth is like? Won't you show me what I'm like? We go to God's Word and we say, Okay, I'm going to prove you to be what I think you're like. And that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Children don't approach reality that way. But strong, wise, smart adults do. God doesn't give grace to proud people. God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. And since we're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2 verse 8, you can be assured that if you have a spirit of pride inside of you right now, if you're approaching the Word of God as if you're standing in authority over it, instead of being in the authority under it, He will not save you. God opposes the proud and He gives grace. You've been saved by grace through faith to the humble. God does not save proud people. It's a big deal. So I beg you, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you, do not use this word like Judas uses a kiss. Don't use this word to win a debate. Don't use this word to get your licks so you can know something somebody else doesn't know and thereby exalt yourself over them and say, ha, look what I know. Don't use God's word for something that's not intended to be used. Please, I beg of you, don't be a Judas with God's word. Don't be a Judas with God's word. Now let's ask God, let's beg God to make sure that he, that it doesn't happen. Let's pray. God, you tell us in your word, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. So at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. God, help us to worship over this word as we stand under the authority of this word. Help us not to stand over against what you say, but help us to stand under it like a person stands under an umbrella when it's raining and the water just sheds off of it and we're dry and we're safe. Help us to stand under you and your word and your protection, rejoicing in your ability to keep us dry in in, in a season of intense sorrow, to keep us strong in seasons of intense weakness, to keep us hopeful in seasons of intense depression. God, help us to stand under the authority of your word so that our marriages might flourish and so that we might raise our children to love you and to honor you and to respect you so that we could help one another to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord so that there would not be a spirit of divisiveness in this church but a spirit of humility and oneness and unity to the praise of your glorious grace Help us, oh God, do what we don't by nature want to do. We don't want to do it. We don't want by nature to stand under your authority. So God, won't you do it for us? Kill the spirit of pride that we all have deep inside. And help us to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. Guard me from error. Speak truth through me, and may it land on hearts that are ready to receive all that you are for us in Jesus Christ, through whose blessed name we pray. Amen. Now, this text, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, and verses 18 and 19, is full of good news regarding the resurrection and the new birth. This is what this sermon series is on. It was going to be a three-part sermon series, and I've increased it to four. We're going to have two sermons from John 3 and two sermons from 1 Peter 1. So in this sermon on 1 Peter 1, we're going to focus on how the resurrection of Jesus Christ relates to the duration of what we receive as our inheritance and to the duration of our enjoyment of that inheritance. What I'm saying from the very outset is this. Peter is very concerned, as is all the apostles in the Word of God, with you knowing two things. Number one, what you receive from God, you receive forever. And number two, 
The life you get from Christ allows you to enjoy what you receive from Christ forever. You need to know the duration of what you receive and the duration of your life that gives you the ability to enjoy what you receive. All right, that's what this sermon is about. Next week, we're going to focus on how the resurrection of Jesus Christ relates to the justification of God's Word. Everything that we just said and we just prayed and that we read every day depends on one event, namely the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, there is no power in God's Word. Jesus says, my words are spirit and they are life. And if Jesus is still in the tomb, so is His Word. But the Word has power to give life because when you go to the tomb and look for Christ, He's not there. God's Word is alive because Christ is alive. And we're going to rejoice over that next week. So, this week, four observations from 1 Peter 1, 3-5, and verses 18 and 19. Here we go. Observation number one from 1 Peter 3, A through C. God causes us to be born again. It's the first thing that you need to know. And this is, I know, review for some of you, but it's important. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. You want to know why you're born again, according to Peter? Why am I born again? Why are you born again? God caused you to be born again. That's why. That's why He says, Blessed be God. Praise be to God. Why? Because God did it. You don't praise God for something He doesn't do. You bless God because He does what He did or did what He does. That's why, you, that's why you praise God. So you are born again because of God. That's an amazing reality. In your state right now, spiritual state, you loving God, rejoicing in His Word, hoping in God, all of these things occur in your life because God causes them to occur. And you say, thank you. God, thank you. Wow, do you remember what it was like before you gloried in Christ? What did you glory in before you gloried in Christ? Drink, sex, food? What was it? What were you doing? What were you spending your life doing? What were you spending all of your energy, exerting all of your energy, running after? Now look, there's a change that's happened, right? The things of the world that once held such a grip, they just fall off. Melt like butter. You're just free. Because God caused this to happen to you. God caused you to be born again. According to His great mercy, He caused you to be born again. You cannot cause yourself to be born again. You just can't. You can't will yourself to be born again. I'm just going to be born again. That's not the way it works. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. 1 John 5, 1. And we're going to go over this verse until you all rejoice over it. Whoever believes in the present that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God in the past. So if you have present belief right now and you ask yourself, well, to what do I owe this present belief? The biblical answer is your new birth. You believe in the present because you were born in the past. And that event of your new birth in the past is so strong, so pervasive, so fruitful that it's causing you to rejoice in God in the present. It's causing you to love your neighbor as yourself. That is the great event that is the catalyst for everything in the Christian life. That one event, that birth causes it all. That's what 1 John 5, 1 says. Whoever believes right here, has been born back here, okay? And when you're born back here, it causes you to believe right here. That's the message. And this is, it's worth rejoicing over. Faith is not the cause of the new birth. It's the effect. Yet, the new birth and faith both happen simultaneously, right? We talked about it last week. And they both happen in accordance with God's grace, which is what, why Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, by grace, you've been saved through faith. By grace... You've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And so when you're reading that verse, you probably should ask, to what does the it refer? By grace you've been saved through faith. This isn't your own doing. It is the gift of God. What is the gift of God? Is it my faith? Is it God's grace? Is it my salvation? Well, this sentence is constructed so that it includes that word it, its antecedent, is the entire preceding section. In other words, everything is the gift of God. 
Your entire salvific experience is God's gift. Your new birth is God's gift. Your faith is God's gift. Your love is God's gift. Your baptism is God's gift. Your obedience is God's gift. Everything is God's gift. And if you don't grasp this reality that everything you receive comes from God, you will not be dumbfounded at what we're going to talk about in verse 5 of 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1 verse 5 should give you immense hope, especially if you wonder whether or not you're going to make it. If you wonder whether or not, I'm not going to make, am I going to do this? Am I going to make it? If you're a child of God and you're scared to death of going to hell still, I want, you need to rejoice over verse 5. And you won't understand why you should rejoice if you don't understand that everything you've received from God, you've received as a gift. What do you have? What, this is what Paul asked the Corinthians. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Okay? So, this is observation number two. And it's from 1 Peter 1, 5. The faith that God gives us when we're born again is the means by which He keeps us alive. Or say it different. The faith that God gives you that made you alive is the very means that God will use to keep you living. All right, this is 1 Peter 1, 5. We, who by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There are two realities with which we must reckon in verse 5, and here they are. Number one, God's power, and number two, our faith. You've got to come to terms with both of these realities. And if you don't stop and slow down and think and meditate, you'll lose the power of it. That's what happened to me. I just, I, I just struggled over this verse. I didn't see it. We, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And one of the reasons I felt the way to this verse is because I just skipped over this prepositional phrase. But when you remove it, when you remove this prepositional phrase that I skipped over, you're going to see why this verse is stripped of its power. So we're going to take the prepositional phrase out of it, okay? One of the prepositional phrases we're going to take out of it, and we're going to read it without it, all right? We are being guarded through faith. For a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see the prepositional phrase I removed? I removed by God's power. Okay? I removed that phrase and I just said, We are being guarded. We are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Without the prepositional phrase, by God's power, this verse is terrible news to you. And here's why it's planted. Or rather, it plants the seed of my preservation, of God getting me to heaven. It plants the seed of preservation in the shallow soil of my own strength and ability to believe. In other words, as long as I can keep on believing, as long as I can just have the mental ascent to believe, I will be guarded. <laughs> I'll just, so I just have to believe the best I can. The reason that Peter tells us that we are being guarded by God's power here is because if you go to chapter 5 in this epistle, there is someone hiding in the cover of the high grass of legalism and licentiousness, and he's stalking his prey, and he's called this in 1 Peter 5, 8, our adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And if you are guarded only by your power and not God, the person that Satan will devour is you. You don't have any power there. You don't have any power over Satan without the resurrected Jesus Christ. Satan's not cast out without the resurrected Jesus Christ. By God's power, we are being protected through our faith in Jesus Christ so that we will receive that which is promised and so that we will tread down our foe as it is written, He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4 and verse 4. The only way you'll overcome Satan, the only way you'll overcome the sin of pornography, alcoholism, drunkenness, premarital sex, adultery, the only way you can overcome anything that comes for the enemy is if someone greater than the enemy resides in you and the gospel says because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit he does 
He does. You don't have to walk around defeated by sin because you have someone in you who's greater than he who is in the world. Our faith in Christ, which was given to us by God when we were born again, is being increased, sustained, and used by God to ensure that we will receive that which has been promised. When we are faithless, He is faithful, which means this. God not only gives you life, God keeps you living through your faith in Jesus Christ. Even when you're faithless, He's faithful. Even when it doesn't seem that you can stand on your own faith, He's there. Answering prayers like, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Remember that prayer in the gospel? Why do prayers like that exist? Prayers like that exist because faith needs to rise in proportion to the struggle. And there are times when we need more faith on this side of the mountain than we did over here. And when you need more faith on this side of the mountain, you've got to go up and say, Oh, God who moves mountains, give me faith. And he does it. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So, the good work that God began in you by faith in Christ he will complete in you by faith in Christ, which is why Jesus is called in Hebrews 12 too, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Faith has its origin in Christ and it finds its perfection in Christ, which means that faith, like everything else in existence, is from Him and through Him and to Him. It comes from a gift It comes from God as a gift. It's worked out through the strength that He supplies in our life. And the result is praise resounding to His glorious name. Because He who began a good work in you will complete it for the day of Jesus Christ. Everything is from Him, through Him, and to Him. Romans 11, 36. Number three. The joys of eternal life and our lives are eternal like Christ. The joy that you have the joys that God has promised you of eternal life and the life that God has promised you through Christ never end. They never end. They are eternal like Christ. This is 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. In other words, you're born again. God calls you to be born again to something. What's it say? You're born to a living hope through something, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so the question we have is, What is this living hope to which we are born? We know that this living hope gets its life from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but to what hope are we called? Notice all of the references that refer to life. Peter wants you to see the connection between your new birth and Jesus being raised from the dead. And you can just look at the vocabulary. He calls us to be born. So when we think of birth, we think of life, right? called us to a living hope, not a dead one, but a one that's alive through the resurrection. That's life. If I've ever seen it, it's life through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable. It doesn't perish. It doesn't fade. It attains its beauty. It doesn't die. It just lives. It exists. Now, Peter's doing something very important in these verses. Okay. He's relating the imperishability of Christ that's evidenced by His resurrection to the imperishability of what we receive from Christ as our inheritance and to the imperishability of our bodies that will be raised in the same manner in which Christ was raised. In other words, He wants you to see that He's going to give you a gift that's going to last forever and in the resurrection, He's going to give you a body that will last forever. You get both things, God's good gifts, which are eternal, and the eternal life with which to enjoy those good gifts. Since Christ is imperishable because of his resurrection from the dead, everything we receive from Christ is imperishable. The joy you get from Christ is imperishable. You get it forever. 
The life you get from Christ is imperishable. You get it forever. The satisfaction you get from Christ is imperishable. You get it forever. God does not give gifts that do not last forever. And this is good news. The reason it's good news is because in Christ you live eternally. An imperishable, undefiled, and unfading inheritance is only good news if you are imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. The only way what, that God gives you, the only way that what God gives you is good news is if you match in duration the gift that God gives you. What good is an imperishable inheritance to you if you're dead? Likewise, what good is a perishable inheritance to you if you're imperishable? If your inheritance outlives you, then you can't enjoy your inheritance. And if you outlive your inheritance, then you can't enjoy your inheritance. <laughs> The guarantee of fullness of joy that comes from God depends on you and your inheritance living forever. And the good news of the gospel is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ ensures this reality. Christ rose from the dead so you could be infinitely happy for all of eternity. Or to say it in the words of Peter, God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Your inheritance is not going to outlive you and you're not going to outlive live your inheritance. You are going to have the ability to enjoy what God gives you infinitely for all of eternity. And that's what fullness of joy is. That's what it is. Anything less is a joy kill. Anything less is this life. Number four, and this goes along what we just said in verse three or number three, rather the joy you inherit from Christ is greater than what you inherit from your parents. Or from anybody else. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Because you've been ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, you've been set free from the emptiness you inherit from everybody that's not Christ. And you can inherit some really good things from your parents. And they're futile, according to the Word of God, ultimately. And there are two things to notice here. And they, and they both have to do with what, with why what we've inherited from our forefathers is futile. And here's the first thing. Notice that we've been ransomed from our inherited futile ways with something, namely the blood of Christ. So according to Peter, you've inherited some futile things from your fathers and they from their fathers. But by the blood of Christ, you have been ransomed from the futility that you inherited. This is important that Peter speaks of the blood because a lamb without blemish or spot is offered up as a sin offering in the, New Te in the Old Testament, which tells us that one of the reasons that what we receive from our forefathers is called futile is because it is tainted with sin. It's not pure. It's not holy like our fathers. It's unholy. It's futile, therefore. So much so that Christ had to die to rescue us from it. Think of that for a second. Think of all the good things you got from your inheritance, from your forefathers. Think of all the good stuff you get. And then here comes Christ and dies and he says, I had to die to ransom you from the futility that you inherited from your parents. And the reason he can speak that way is because even when we inherit things that are good in and of themselves, we inherit natures that are not good. And when you combine something that's good with a nature that isn't, you have a misuse of God's gift, like using a kiss to betray the Son of God or using a mother's, goat, a mother's milk to boil her baby goat in. It's not what milk is for. Milk is to give life. It's not to take life. But when sin enters in, we take what is meant to give life and we turn it into an instrument of death. And it's futile. It's futile. And Christ came to rescue us from that. And I want to make this applicable to you. And it may, I might be off here, but just bear with this example. 
men and women, if you're a man, some of you inherited a lot of things from your forefathers, right? Businesses, maybe a love for sports or a specific team or a vocation, whatever it may be. And you probably remember from an early age seeing your father's love for that something in particular and maybe even attaching yourself to that which your father loved, right? Because he loved it. I'm not, an example is Alabama football, my dad. He loved Alabama football. And when I was old enough to know what love looked like and saw him love that, well, pff, absolutely, roll tide, right? I mean, because he's my dad. He's my dad. I want to love what he loves. But in attaching ourselves to what our forefathers loved, we learn behaviors and attitudes that exist in sinful humanity and allow them to shape our identity and joy. So the innocent love of, innocent joy of loving the game dies and it's replaced by playing the game a certain way in order to receive a certain result. And thus we attach our identity and it becomes intertwined with what we do and the success with which we do it. It's not enough to repair cars. You must become a car repair man. And those are two different things altogether. One of them is doing something for a living and the other is getting an identity from what you do for a living. And these things just kind of intermix together. And when that happens, our joy and our sense of approval and our sense of purpose all becomes futile because we find our identity from those who are passing away. That's why it's futile. And if you think, huh, is this a, even a biblical concept? Think back to 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. And then he tells us what's in the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Okay, that's what's in the world. Do not love the world. Why? Because all that is in the world is not from the Father, but is from the world. When you love, when you would inherit a love for something from someone that's of this world and it becomes your identity, you find identity in that which is futile because it's from the wrong person. You inherit from people that die a love for things that will too die. And that's the essence of futility. And so if you're a woman, it's almost a guarantee that your love for makeup or jewelry or clothing or hair or styles or purses Or self-sufficiency, you want to be a self-sufficient woman? Maybe you were raised with a woman who was self-sufficient. I don't need a man. All these things and 10 million things that we as guys don't understand are inherited from your mom. But somewhere along the way, you learn behaviors and attitudes that sinfully exist in your mothers and you begin to attach your identity to that which you love and thus your joy. And if you do not believe me, Every woman in this room probably remembers loving a piece of clothing, putting it on, and remembers vividly hearing these words, it makes you look fat. You remember the first time someone said to you, a piece of clothing makes you look fat. Yeah, you remember it. Or, why do you feverishly clean the house when you have guests coming over? Why does it all have to be decorated? Put in place. There's dust in the corner. Get it up before somebody sees it. It's because somewhere along the way, you were taught explicitly or implicitly that your identity, the way in which you keep the house clean, the way in which you look, your identity is tied to those reality. So if the house is clean, I've got it all together. That is what the house being clean represents. And it's futile. It is futile. Why do you get your hair done? I I had a woman say to me, I will never forget the first time I was taken to get highlights. I was nine years old and I couldn't stop thinking, what's wrong with my hair? What's wrong with my hair? When that happens, our joy, our sense of approval, our identity, our sense of purpose all become futile because we're finding identity from those who are passing away. Those things are not from the father. They're from your earthly father or your earthly mother.
They're just going to die. In order for our lives to have meaning, we need something that's from our Heavenly Father and that lasts as long as our Heavenly Father does, which brings us to the second observation from 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You were ransomed from futile ways by something imperishable, namely the blood of Christ. You weren't ransomed with silver and gold that perishes, but with something that does not perish. And the question that we should ask is why does Peter set the eternality of the blood of Christ over against the temporality of silver and gold? Why does he do it? Why does he say your ransom was something internal from something that is temporary? That's what he wants you to see. He wants you to see the duration of Christ's blood and the brevity of what you love in this life. And you have to say, why is he doing this? Here's why. Peter wants us to know that we, what we have been ransomed with is much different from what we have been ransomed from. The first reason that we've inherited from our, that what we've inherited from our fathers is futile is because number one, it's from our fathers. Here's the second reason. The second reason that what we receive from our earthly fathers is futile is because that which we receive from our heavenly father or our earthly father is perishable, which goes right back to the second reason not to love the world in verse in first John 2, 15 and 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world for all that is in the world is not from the father, but is from the world. That's reason number one. Number two, and the world is passing away. It's passing away. It's passing away. But that which we receive from our Heavenly Father is imperishable, like the blood of Christ and like our Heavenly Father. Thus, Christ died so that those who are born of Him might live forever and in living forever be eternally happy in Him. One of the greatest tragedies in life is that the greatest joys come in durations of moments. Think about it. Your greatest joys happen in moments. And then the rest of your life is spent chasing that high, that one high you got from one moment, like a junkie chasing, chasing his first high. We chase temporary joy and we try to recapture it and it's never there. It's never there. It's like a vapor that appears for a moment and vanishes away. And there's only one remedy to this vicious cycle. You must have joy in that which will not perish and must be imperishable to enjoy that which is eternal. And the good news of the gospel is Christ died to give you both. He died to give you something that will not outlive you. And he, di he died to give you life so that you would live as long as the gift which he has has given. You have an imperishable inheritance that you cannot outlive and you have an imperishable inheritance that will not outlive you because Christ died so that you could be born again to a living hope. Christ died to give you God. That's what you have to look forward to. That is the best gift of God. The best gift that God can give is God himself. And eternity will be a never-ending crescendo of joy in God who will be an inexhaustible source of joy and delight and peace and adventure and rest and anything else you can imagine. You will wear out 100,000 years of eternity trying to exhaust this joy in God and when you get to where you are in the present you will look forward to where you've come from and then or backward to where you've come from and then forward to where you're going and then you will realize in that moment that these 100,000 years are but a point to what remains but a point that's how much longer you have left to go and you will never get to the bottom of God you will not be in eternity bored forever you will not be in eternity bored forever you will be in eternity constantly having your breath taken away in your body, which you have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, ravished by God and his unending love for you. And it is so immense that Paul says, the heart of man can't imagine what God's prepared for those that love him. My words are like dust, dust in the scales of God's glory and they don't even move them and so this is the charge that we end with when you are risen with Christ to a living hope 
the plea that you must hear is this. Die to this futile world and live for this imperishable source of joy. And if you don't think that you're not alive to futility, how much time do you spend on your phone? How much time do you spend in front of your television binging on Netflix? How much time do you spend binging on a bag of cookies or chips? How much time do you view watching porn? How much time do you view lusting? How, how much time do you use and waste on futile things? Die to the futility of iPhones and iWatches and selfies and groupies and orgies and whatever else is out there. Quit wasting your life. You weren't created to do diddly things. You were created to know God. This life is a little two-second slice and then it's either with Him or without Him forever. Quit running the marathon of faith and stopping by the hydration station and pushing water to the side and then taping ankle weights to your ankles. Why? Why do we do it? Why do we take dumbbells to this race of faith to weigh us down? Cast it aside. Cast it aside. Die to futility. Die to the futility of self-righteousness. Those of you who think you can do something of your own accord to get right with God, to make God happy with you, to impress God, study more, pray more, come to church more, sing louder, whatever it is, die to the futility of self-righteousness. Live, live to the person of Jesus Christ and the identity that you get from Christ. Die to the futility of pride in your life. If you're worried about what you look like or what your clothes are like on you or if you're overweight or underweight, if you have the pride of life in you and you just can't die to Google, go home and Google what a body he looks like after 50 years of decomposition and you'll get a real good idea about what you are look at a skeleton in a casket that's you apart from Christ and the only way he gets any different is if you're in him die to the futility of Disneyland America or oh, we want to be entertained so much so that there is a TV in every hospital room so that even before we take the last breath, before we can meet our Creator, we'll die watching something. God forbid I die not entertained. This world is futile. It's transitory. It's temporary. The shadows shift. But God never does. Die to futility and live to Christ. Let's pray. We need your help with this, God. Unfortunately, we love coal more than we love diamonds. We, do, we love dust more than we love glory. And I pray that you would not have our sin be such a judge against us that what we love in this life would be what we would return to in the next dust. But rather, help us to love you in this life and thus experience a resurrection, not to the second death, but to life eternal. Help us to know that when we look at Jesus' resurrection, we shouldn't just say, oh, good for Jesus. We should say, oh, good for us. Good for us. Christ died so that we could live, and he lives now so that we can know that just like He was risen from the dead to live forever, we too have been raised from the dead, not to die, but to live forever and to enjoy all that You are for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Unite our hearts to fear Your name. Do it for us, we pray today, God. May Your Word abound. God, speed, give it speed, O God, and may it be an aroma of life leading to eternal life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.